Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you today and uh, to be with you. Uh, we are back uh, from the mission trip last night at 8 o'clock. Uh, we arrived back in Elgin. And I have to tell you, I'm pretty proud of the fact that at least a few of our people made it here to worship today because it was work to drag ourselves out of bed to be here. Um, I felt like I could sleep for another couple of days. So anybody who is on the mission trip, I want you to stand. Um, we've, we've got uh, Underhills and uh, Matthew Schultz is here. And actually, Chloe and Matthew are scripture readers today. And, and Dakota is here, and as is Amanda. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the effort to be here. Um, the only other announcement I have is that a week from today, we launch Vacation Bible School, and I know you'll be hearing more from uh, Beth, um, Beth Lindquist about that, but um, I want you all to know that there is a pool party next Sunday at Wing Park from 6.30 to 8.30. We've rented out the pool. It is just for our church, and so come Bring your neighbors, bring your grandchildren, bring your friends, bring anybody who wants to come. If you've ever been to Wing Park Pool, it's a big place, and there's lots of room for all of us. So please make sure anybody and everybody you know is there. It's a lot of fun. So 6.30 to 8.30, the 23rd. Um, welcome to worship, and I also... Uh, we'll say welcome to Pat Lindquist and to Beth Lindquist, who are leading us in worship today. And I thank God for them, because you wouldn't want to be hearing me preach today. I, my, my head is full of mission trip. Um, and Beth is actually doing the preaching. So thank you. Thanks for, for doing this for us. Okay. <laughs> Let us remember that no let us remember that guided by the Holy Spirit, the purpose of First Congregational Church, a United Church of Christ in Elgin, is to seek God's truth, practice Christ's teachings, and love others unconditionally. We gather today seeking the peace Christ gives us. We gather despite many conflict, many doubt within our souls. We gather longing for the breath of God's Spirit to give us courage and renewal. Come, Christ, be our, be our guest. Bless us through the power of your Spirit. Give us the courage.
Let us pray. God, your compassion is for all people and all creation. Help us to share the burden of your heart concerning our troubled and violent world. Teach us to trust in you more than in the technology of destruction, that we be peacemakers like Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good morning. Ooh. So this would normally be the time I'd invite children forward. We're a little low on children, so I'd like to invite anyone who feels young at heart to come forward. So there's my peeps. I know they had my back. All right. How many of you play a sport? Show of hands. Okay, a few of you. How about how many of you play an instrument? All right, very good. We have some talented folks here. Now, how many of you are coming to Vacation Bible School next week? <laughs> awesome, all right, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you want to. We always love having you, no matter how long you can be there. So yes, we'd love to have you guys volunteer with us. There are a lot of reasons why I love Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School? Well, that's when we all get together and we learn some stories, sing some songs, eat some snacks, play some games, make some crafts. It's a lot of fun. And this year's theme is all about superheroes. So those are all some pretty good reasons to come to Vacation Bible School, actually. But my favorite reason for coming to Vacation Bible School is because it helps me practice being a child of God. We have to practice something to be good at it, right? You guys have to practice your sports and your instruments. And if we don't practice, then we kind of lose that skill. Well, our faith is the same way. So I have three things with me this morning that remind me of what it means to practice my faith. The first thing is a carrot. <laughs> a carrot is hard. It's unbendable. It's firm. We know what the carrot is about. But when a carrot spends too much time in hot water, a carrot becomes soft, maybe even mushy, kind of falls apart like baby food, right? Then I have an egg. Some of us are kind of like an egg. We have a smooth exterior and we're soft on the inside. But if an egg spends too much time in hot water, well, that shell can shatter and it's hard on the inside. Now, the last thing I have is coffee. <laughs> I hear all the adults going, oh yeah. To be honest, it's not coffee for me, it's Diet Coke, but that doesn't have the same <laughs> impact. <laughs> coffee has a very distinct smell. A lot of people find it very pleasing. It's a strong aroma. And when coffee comes in contact with hot water, it changes the water. It still has a strong smell. It's still quite pleasing to a lot of us, but it changed its surroundings. Our faith, and practicing our faith helps make us stronger as children of God. And so when we do things like going to worship and coming to vacation Bible school and Sunday school, these are all ways that we practice our faith and it makes us stronger. And when we're stronger, we can be even more courageous 
just like the superheroes we're going to be talking about at Vacation Bible School. I hope you guys are going to come to Vacation Bible School. I hope you are interested in volunteering. If you can't volunteer, if you can't attend, then please at least pray for us, because this is a really special time in the life of the children who attend. So let's say a quick prayer. I'm going to say a line. You guys repeat it after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for making us your children. We thank you for opportunities to practice our faith and maybe change our circumstances. Amen. All right, you guys can go back and join your families. Our first reading is from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 10 through 17, page 440 in Pew Bible and 552 in large print. Then Esther spoke to Hattach and gave him a message from Mordecai, for Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that If any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself have not been called to come to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai that told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think that In the king's palace, you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you did. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as as Esther had ordered him. Our second reading today is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14, found on page 440 in your pew Bible and 552 in the large print. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. Good Lord. 
So coming from a Christian education background, I'm used to an audience that can only stay with me for a few minutes. So heads up, this is a short sermon. Um, you're welcome for that time back in your day. I had awareness of the story of Esther from my childhood Sunday school days, but it never really stuck with me until I stumbled upon the 2006 film, One Night with the King. Uh, the title sounds a little more risque than it really is. The story is pretty true to the Bible. This message isn't about the movie. I just thought it was funny there was a movie about the message even though Paris isn't here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of Esther, but let me give you a refresher. Hadassah, known as Esther, is an orphan Jewish teen living with her cousin Mordecai and his family in Persia. When the Persian king Xerxes is in search of a new queen, all the young women in the land are rounded up, basically kidnapped, to participate in a beauty pageant of sorts. Of course, it isn't all the king finds Esther pleasing, and she is crowned a king, queen. Of course, it isn't all princess parties and fancy gowns. This is not an ideal marriage, and the king is known for flashes of temper that often resulted in people losing their head. When righteous cousin Mordecai infuriates Haman, a trusted advisor to the king, Haman orchestrates a plot to have all the Jews in Persia killed. Mordecai pleads with Esther to use her position in the palace to save her people. As we heard in the Bible, Esther is reluctant to take a risk that could result in her own death. Eventually, Esther is inspired to step forward. She approaches the king, and the Jewish people are protected. In some retellings of the story, we focus on Esther's beauty and her charm, her shrewd thinking that saves her people. But I find myself drawn to the girl that was plucked out of obscurity and found herself in a time and place where she could make an impact. What can we learn from the story of Esther and Mordecai? For beginners, Esther and Mordecai are faithful children of God. Mordecai has a strong sense of justice as a Jew and Esther practices the traditions of her father's father's father in praying and fasting. Both of them showed great courage and careful planning, and I think Esther and Mordecai would make excellent disciples at FCC. Esther is open to what we might call constructive criticism, and Mordecai is wise enough to know how to motivate. Mordecai has some harsh words for Esther about what it means to fail in this moment but he also presents Esther with an incredible invitation. Perhaps you are here for just such a time as this. Talk about pumping up someone's ego. So we can take away a few things already, the significance of faith and be open to advice. But what else can we learn from this story? How about following God can mean that we have to sacrifice our own security? 20 years ago, I thought I had it figured out. I attended mission trips every summer, I joined the International Student Organization, and I supported the new LBGT group opening on campus. I thought I was worldly. After all, I had been to over half of the continental United States and all the way to Canada. And I was a progressive Christian. I was the poster child for individual and social responsibility. Mother Teresa would have been impressed with my empathy for those less fortunate. Now I find myself overwhelmed by the onslaught of hate and violence, constant fear, and persistent injustice that floods our social media and cable news. I'm at a loss. Where do we begin to change the world? No longer do I feel brave enough to stand up to these oppressors I'm not trained for that kind of stuff. Um, I have a career and a home and a family. I don't think I'm the right person to rock the boat. The food banks and soup kitchens are overwhelmed by the working poor, this new social class where you do everything right and you're still coming up short. I feel really bad. I mean, I feel really bad. 
But um, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I think there's paperwork involved, and I just think there's a lot of good people around here. Somebody else can take care of that. But you know what? There's actually something about that way of thinking in this morning's scripture. Mordecai tells Esther that relief and deliverance might come from somewhere else. But what will she lose by disregarding her call in this moment? If you're following along, we have learned that we need to keep our faith strong by practice, be open to new perspectives, and listen to what is calling at your heart now so that we are prepared to make an impact. But what does this look like? Will we be able to recognize the opportunity? God put us in certain circumstances to benefit or even rescue others. Are you a carrot, an egg, or coffee? Our education as a child of God is ongoing through the experiences we have. Our hot water moments are shaping us. God is hoping that we will be like the coffee and change the space around us. Sometimes God will have to close a door in order to force us out the window because God needs us to be on the other side of that window. Paul reminded the Philippians of just that. Wholeness of life does not come from material things or only those happy times. Our joy can only be realized by accepting God is in control. When we look back at Esther, Mordecai, and Paul, we recognize the long tradition God has of giving our experiences meaning. Let me say that I'm not trying to minimize those upheavals and losses that hurt deep down in your soul. Sometimes we wonder if we will ever feel peace again. But please hear, God knows that hurt. God is present with you. You have already been crowned a child of God, no need for pageants. The creator, the great redeemer, sees you and she believes in you. She believes in your resilience. Which leads me to my next point. God uses powerless people in his powerful things. You can do all things through the strength that comes from God alone. I got a thing for princesses, as many people know. I can identify with the heroine of just about every fairy tale, and Esther's story has the framework for a great fairy tale. Pathetic heroine facing tragedy, meets a king who digs her and makes her a queen. He rubber stamps the genocide of her people, and they all live happily ever after. Okay, so maybe it's not the perfect fairy tale. The good news is the story was changed when one woman stepped forward. And you know what? She still lived happily ever after. Our happily ever after is what rises up from that hot water. When we practice our faith through all the elements of discipleship, including worship and prayer and service, we are made stronger than the tough times. And when we are empowered by that strength, we can courageously step forward. The thing about being courageous is it comes in big and little moments. As a member of church council, a ministry chair, and a member of this congregation, I've had the opportunity to participate in the r and process. I have to tell you honestly, I'm struggling with all this change. <laughs> but I hear an intent to be more deliberate in our ministries. I think you're gonna hear us talk about evaluating the success of our programs, including timelines. This might mean we're going to have to let go of some of the things we do. We'll have to be courageous in our faith that God will fill that space with something new and re-energized. I think you're going to hear about some fresh and exciting outreach opportunities, drawing on the gifts and experience of this congregation. You remember that toddler toy that was the different shapes and you could stick them in the different holes that were the same shape? I want to tell you, my friend, bring your star-shaped self right here because I have a star-shaped hole for you. If you're a square, 
I have a spot for squares. If you're as complex as three sides or five sides or a classic circle, this congregation has a place for you. You were born, shaped, God gifted, and God fortified for something that is calling on your heart right now. We can sit and wait for God's invitation to participate in this relationship. I understand she sometimes talks through burning bushes, so maybe we'll each get one of those messages. Or we can feel that deep, higher calling to serve where God has already led us. It may not be as big a story as Esther or Paul, but it will not be any less significant because you were born for this. Thank you. As we ponder the words of that sermon, I invite you into a time of quiet prayer and reflection. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We offer ourselves with our gifts 
confident that you have a purpose for them and for us. Expand our limited vision to embrace new possibilities. We rededicate our lives at this altar. May our offerings reach beyond the barriers of our former thinking and doing. In the spirit of Christ, we would pray and live. Amen. Would you please take the hand of your neighbor? Go out into the world, love and serve the Lord. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.